Welcome everybody to episode 158 of the Startup Show. Today I'm talking to the CEO and co-founder of Gamaya, Yosef, and we are talking about agricultural tech, we talk about the commercialization of uh, research, but we also talk about uh, work-life balance and how to start a business. Make sure to stay tuned for the entire video. Welcome everybody to episode 158 of The Startup Show. Today we are here in Zurich and I'm very excited to talk to the CEO and co-founder of Gamaya. Josef, welcome to the show. Pleasure to be here. Josef, it's just a pleasure to have you on the show. Um, I've been following Gamaya for a very, very long time and I'm very excited to, to finally host you here on the show. My name is Josef Achtman. Uh, I was born in Ukraine. Uh, I uh, moved to Israel with my family when I was uh, a kid. Uh, I grew up in Israel and studied there. Then I uh, went to do my PhD in the UK. I lived in the UK for a while. Then I moved to Caribbean. I lived there for a while. And then finally I came to Switzerland to the postdoc in remote sensing. So that's some um, specializing in uh, remote sensing in mobile robotics. This is kind of m my two areas of uh, expertise as mm -hmm. part of my research. And this is what we are trying to do now, continue to do in Gamaya. Being ac in academia and then moving into entrepreneurship is not like such a simple um, endeavor. How did you experience this transition from academia into entrepreneurship? Uh, my approach was always uh, very hands-on. I really liked the uh, things that were on the interface between the technology and the environment. Uh, my original education, my degree was in physics. And then my doctorate was in uh, something that was very theoretical. And then from then on, I was really trying to find applications and what was kind of my expertise in technology that had to do with the natural environment. Mm -hmm. uh, so actually, after my postdoc, I started to do uh, robotic uh, submarines, and that was uh, a very successful project. When I came to Switzerland, my main interest was how can I apply uh, the technology for the research of the environment. I had quite interesting projects that I was involved in, but I, there was always a feeling that kind of the academia it does not allow you to move forward fast enough somehow. Yes. <laughs> it doesn't just uh, give you enough environment to make things happen fast. At some point, we felt that we developed some very interesting, novel, and potentially very valuable technology. But I felt like there was no, we, we reached a limit of what we could do with this technology within the boundaries of academia. Mm -hmm. And that, that what led us to the conclusion that we need to try to commercialize it. Yep. With an objective basically of continuing to do what we did because we absolutely loved doing this, me and my colleagues. And the only way, basically, to continue doing this was to transition it into uh, into commercial domain. Right. Now, when you look into do this like transition time of commercialization, what would you say are, let's say, where the biggest challenges or pitfalls that you would say like, oh, you wish you knew about them before? I think I really uh, underestimated. I would say the challenge, the difficulty of cross the boundary between what works in the lab and what is actually the level of maturity of the technology that is necessary to make an industrial commercial product. Mm -hmm. To cross this boundary and bring sophisticated technology from the lab to the natural environment, to the agricultural field, is something that I wish I would be able to estimate better when we yeah. started. Right. Okay, so let's talk about uh, Gamaya. Um, maybe for, for the two people out there who don't know what Gamaya is, <laughs> And uh, maybe you can give us like a short pitch about, about your startup. So the technology, so the specific technology that we've been working on as part of uh, my academic research is called hyperspectral imaging. It's a very advanced imaging technique that combines spectroscopy with imaging. I think a lot of people are familiar with spectroscopy. Spectroscopy is the idea that you can analyze the chemical and biological properties of materials by 
studying the light that is reflected from the surface. Basically, there is a light source or sunlight. It hits the surface and interacts with molecular structure. It reflects in certain ways. And then you can study the uh, reflected light and you can determine what is the actual molecular composition of the, uh, of the surface. This is what is used uh, in astronomy, in chemistry, and pretty much spectroscopy is used in, across all industries, essentially. What we set out to do is combine spectroscopy with imagery, where you can basically image very large surfaces, and in agriculture you deal with very large surfaces. You collect all of this data, and then you can basically, in post-processing, you can do spectroscopy in every single pixel of the image. And this allows you, obviously, to learn a lot about the condition of whatever surfaces you are imaging. Uh, hyperspectral imaging has been around for maybe 20 years. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily in itself as a concept new. However, until very recently, it has been extremely expensive and complex technology to use. Yeah. So it has been really constrained to very few domains, such as military and um, oil prospection, and few other industrial domains, but really the applications were extremely limited. During my research, we developed a new type of very small, compact hyperspectral imaging camera uh, that allowed us, or at least gave us the understanding that we can now make this technology, the benefits of the technology, available for much broader scope of applications. However, while doing this, we also realized that most of the value of what we do lies not in the technology itself, not in the hardware, but in the interpretation and the analytics that you can derive from the data. Mm -hmm. And so for that, you actually need to develop a very deep domain-specific knowledge. You need to specialize. We decided to specialize in agriculture. We decided to use this hyperspectral imaging technology for analysis of crops and basically with the idea that knowing the condition of crops uh, can help farmers to basically optimize agricultural operations, reduce cost, optimize use of inputs, use of chemicals, reduce the amount of pesticides and herbicides yeah. that they are using, improve the quality and the quantity of the yield, etc. Mm -hmm. Now, when you look at, let's say, um, your team, I mean, like whenever you have like some research uh, backed startups. Um, how did you assemble your team to find the right team members? I think generally what happens, uh, especially when you have technology transfer between academia and a startup, you start with the people that are around you. I started with my colleague uh, Dragos Konstantin, who was a PhD student at the time. He was developing this technology as part of our research. And we also were joined by our co-founder, uh, uh, Igor Ivanov, uh, who is more on the business development uh, business side. So basically, we started with people that we had around it. There are a mm -hmm. few people directly, uh, our colleagues from the lab, that were the early employees that yes. uh, basically joined us. Once you have this core people that basically more or less people that go around you where you're developing inside the ecosystem, inside the lab, mm -hmm. then you suddenly start to see that you have gaps of certain expertise. And then you start to look uh, for the people that you are missing. First, within the immediate network, you just ask people around, whether you know somebody who knows this kind of, has the, this expertise or that expertise. And then finally, obviously, as you grow, your network expands, uh, you become more, much more systematic with the way that you find people, or much more professional, I would say. Yeah. Gamaya was founded in 2015, if I saw correctly. You yes. were, I think, every year from then on the top 100 uh, companies um, in, in this ranking in Switzerland. What would you say uh, that even though you were like in these rankings and everything, what were the biggest challenges of, of like being considered like a successful startup from very early on? We started as a, as a deep technology company. We started with an idea that we have this core, very sophisticated, unique technology that has tremendous potential. Uh, however, developing very complex technology requires capital and time mm -hmm. and effort. Always does. Yes. If you are presenting yourself as purely tech startup, outcome of what you are doing will be a technology a few years down the line. 
uh, then it's actually incredibly difficult to attract capital. There are only a few places in the world where you can say I have this absolutely awesome technology that will lead to, to revolutionize the world in 10 years' time, okay, and people will give you money to work yes. 10 years uh, on developing this technology. Essentially, it's, uh, it's uh, U.S. and Israel, essentially, where you can do something like this. So for the rest of us, is you need to say, okay, we'll have this roadmap, we'll have these uh, milestones along the way, and we'll start with something simple, and we'll start to actually generate some revenues, actually developing, building a business, while we continue to develop and, and mature kind of the core unique technological yes. capability. Uh, and so we had some really hard times positioning ourselves between saying we are a technology company because we have this absolutely unique technology that nobody else in the world has, and we will continue to work uh, on this technology. And at the same time, what are the steps that we will take to actually already generate some commercial traction and uh, already some generate some leverage in, in the market and, uh, and generate revenues? I'm really deeply appreciative for, for the ranking, but I actually it's very difficult for me to see how do you compare all this very heterogeneous you know, yes. space of different startups at different stages with different technologies, with yeah. different potential, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I mean, like what, what was interesting, I mean, like some, to talk some about the achievement, but also like the products you have, like one is called Canfit, Soyfit, and now you also have Tobacco Fit, right? Yes. So, so how is this now working together like with, with Philip Morris, like when it's like really like going into tobacco, maybe something you haven't expected like from the get-go that like that could be a potential partner? Again, going back to the, uh, this point that uh, you have this really complex technology, it's very hard to get it to work out of the door. It's not something that is plug and play. Yeah. Uh, so the way to bridge this gap is always partnerships. You need to have somebody with capital, with vision, uh, to say, okay, I see how this can help me. I know that it's perhaps not working just yet, but I totally see how it will work in two years, three years' time, yes. right? They actually financed uh, some of the R&D and some of the efforts to get this technology to market, to get this technology in the field. And we are now reaching a stage where this technology becomes productive right. on some of the farms in Brazil. Now, one of the other achievements that you had is the Swiss Economic Award in, in uh, 2017. Yeah. How did like that award affect your, let's say, like public perception of Gamaya? This definitely helps to get the word out there, to grow your network. It brings publicity, it brings recognition, it does not reduce the amount of work that needs to be done. <laughs> uh, so uh, obviously it played a significant role in our ability as other things, among other things. Uh, we managed to secure uh, our investment. We needed capital to basically develop the technology. We still do, we continue to fundraise and uh, having these awards um, and in particular the Swiss Economic Forum Award played a part in this because for investors, uh, okay, there's this guy uh, that comes from the uh, university and says he has this fancy technology. It's very difficult for investors to actually figure out, is it real, is it not? It's very difficult for, for to get into the depths of the technology, especially when we are talking to, about something that is uh, not necessarily working today, it's something that is supposed to work in, in, in some time in the future. Uh, so having these awards, it's a, a kind of symbol of recognition that you see that people believe in the vision, people believe in the significance of this idea and significance of this technology. So this is definitely plays a tremendous role in our ability to yeah. secure the support of investors and, uh, and the capital that is necessary to continue to develop the technology. Talking of capital, um, according to Crunchbase, you raised about 7.4 million Swiss francs. Yes. But like what I'm more in interested in is uh, one of our previous guests was Daddy Gutenberg. So I don't know if he's part of the investors, but VI Partners is. Yes. Um, yeah. Maybe you can elaborate as, as especially just like how, how let's say, they beyond capital um, helped you grow the business and how that relationship established? So VI Partners is, a, is one of the uh, oldest, uh, most established uh, venture capital firms in Switzerland, to the best of my knowledge. We came to them quite early on. 
it's obviously the support of VI partners is again, it's another kind of piece in the puzzle of building your network, establishing your credibility. You, you operate in, in the farming space. Yeah. Um, my question would be like, when you look at, let's say, the farming space of the next five to 10 years, what, what kind of like developments do you see there? Um, maybe not necessarily around Gamaya, but in general, like the market that you perceive there, like what will be the latest tech trends um, within the farming field? Since the beginning of agriculture. Yeah. There's one trend that was uh, unstoppable and relentless, which is people don't like to do farming. There's less and less, there's a continuous trend. There's some statistics from, I believe from World Economic Forum, is that uh, there's a continuous relentless trend that there are less and less people that are working the land. Farming is actually really, really hard. People don't like to dig the dirt. And they use any opportunity possible to do whatever they can if they have an opportunity instead of doing farming. The population is growing. Uh, the uh, production, the output of agriculture industry will have to continue to increase. But the number of people that are involved in farming will continue to decrease. Yeah. So this leads me to a single conclusion is that automation will play an increasing role. So obviously first there was the farm animals, it was kind of innovation yeah. in the agricultural industry. Then obviously with the industrial revolution, there were tractors. There, there were several stages, I'm skipping quite a few steps, but obviously autonomous tractors will be in the field long before autonomous cars will be in the streets. Yes. Yeah, so it's a, if you compare the complexity of driving an autonomous tractor in the field versus f driving an autonomous car in the city, it's several orders of magnitude lower mm. complexity. Yes. So this is what is happening already today and will continue to happen. Now, in order to have an autonomous tractor in the field, you need to have a, some kind of automated digital agronomy system. You need to have intelligence in the system that will tell the tractor, autonomous tractor, where to go and what to do. You will need to build these layers of uh, uh, digital agronomy, agronomy intelligence, if you will. And this is the trend that we are part of. Yep. We are trying to build uh, this intelligence in the system and try to automate some of the decision-making process, some of the data collection, analytics, and decision-making automation uh, that will allow this continuous improvement of efficiency and sustainability of agricultural practices to improve. When you look back or think back of, let's say, your, your early stages, the first steps of Gamaya, and you were still, let's say, part of the, of the postdoc, do you feel uh, academia helped you in certain ways to really launch your startup? In certain ways, definitely yes. First of all, I, I should say that there's a tremendous effort to improve uh, some of these processes. And yeah. I know that actually even, even within, since we started, there were multiple mechanisms that uh, were implemented to help startups launch faster, better, more efficient. So there's a, there's a lot of work that is done to improve. Actually, e even in our case, this initial launch, uh, organizations like VentureKick, right? Uh, there was a tremendous help and support from them. So uh, I think without this uh, help, uh, we wouldn't definitely wouldn't make it as yeah. far as we did. So in the initial stage, there's this very significant support. This uh, Death Valley problem, yes. where uh, you, um, the technology is working, but then you still need to bridge this very significant gap between working technology and a commercially viable product. And this is where a lot of early support mechanisms, including the ones that come from EPFL, ETH, already kind of let go. Mm -hmm. They are no longer relevant. Commercial traction is not quite yet there. Uh, the proper large venture funds are still cannot really interest, are not, not really interested to yeah. get involved. And so this Death Valley gap is a, is a tremendous problem. You grew up in Israel and you also like see like what is going on here. Um, uh, where do you see, let's say, the major differences uh, or let's say to take it even a step further, how can Switzerland improve the startup ecosystem on a national level? 
a lot of it has to do with uh, with culture and mentality. It's not something that uh, and and again I, I should say that uh, <coughs> Swiss startup is a is a fantastic, very active and very creative ecosystem. There's a tremendous amount of innovation happening in Switzerland, like hands down, in comparison to anybody, in comparison to Israel, the United States. The, 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 there's as much innovation or more than anywhere in terms of building businesses in Israel and in the United States, for sure, there's a culture of, tremendous culture of risk-taking. People are just prepared to go for it and, and try it and perhaps fail, but they, they are ready to go for it. And this, is a, this uh, stands for the um, founders, people that are ready to leave their you know, jobs in, in banks or in, in big corporations and move to startups and also importantly it has to do with investors mm -hmm. investors that are ready to support high risk projects not something that you can just See switch it's a, it's it's really um, culture mentality thing <coughs> uh, there is another thing is that and, and it's very much linked that in the united states and also to some extent in israel you have this industrial process of building businesses yeah. you have kind of conveyor belt belt and everything is prepared and you have good idea coming on one side and then this assembly line that assembles <laughs> it into a big uh, successful business on the other uh, this is kind of industrial business creation environment that does not exist uh, anywhere else mm -hmm. uh, and so it's something that needs to emerge over time it's not something that is easy to create but it's something that is being created, I think, in Switzerland as we speak. How do you achieve and maintain, maintain a balanced life? I don't. <laughs> okay. Do you want to expand on this? <laughs> <laughs> no, maybe one sentence yeah. of like, what yeah. don't you maintain? It's, it's, uh, it's very, very hard. It's uh, very hard on my family. It's, uh, it's very hard on me. Uh, but again, this is something that at some level, you, if you decide to try to build a business, particularly in high, you know, deep tech, high risk technology, this is the sacrifice that you, not everything is a question of finding the right balance. Sometimes you just need to go for it and get it done. Yes. And this is something that if you read, I mean, any of the, you know, stories of how big companies are created. There's no life uh, work balance. It's, uh, it's people decided that they're going to f go for it and get it done and they just go and do it. What is success in life for you? Finding the purpose, finding the meaning. Continuously look for meaning. And if you found the meaning, that you found the meaning, then you will be happy. If you're not, then you have to continue searching. How did you get your first paying client? We actually, in our case, we started very gradually. Uh, we started with uh, this very unique technology. From the get-go, we had some academics, some researchers that saw it as an opportunity to do some unique research. And we started to look for them directly again within the uh, eco academic ecosystem. So we had a gradual kind of stuff, first working with the research labs, and then we had some a few bigger projects, in particular with Philip Morris. It's difficult to me to pinpoint like this was the moment that we found our first paying customer. When you look now at investors, what do you think is most important to you uh, when you onboard a new investor? I think shared uh, shared vision, but it's much more complex than that. It's very difficult to pinpoint just one indicator. You need to be able to continuously work with investors always you will run whatever the initial discussion was, there will be a point where you run into disagreements. And the only thing that you need to be able to continue to do is continue to talk and work it out with investors. Uh, and this ability to work it out and to allow for us to jointly to move forward, this is, I think, the most critical bit. But, it, I, but it's a, a lot of people, it's, it's, a, a, it's a lot of people are talking, it's like getting married. So it's kind of the sa same yes. set of considerations. <laughs> what traits do you look for when you hire someone? I ask people, I have this one particular question that I'm asking, but that I read somewhere uh, that is very helpful to me. I ask people to say, what is it that they know that nobody else knows? 
and uh, this helps me to understand how they think uh, a lot. But there are lots of considerations, and I think for different jobs, it's <laughs> also very different profile. So I'm just throwing one particular thing that I'm yes. uh, uh, kind of a little bit gimmicky even. But yeah. I'm, I'm asking people, what is it that they know that nobody else does? And, and this is very insightful. So because what were I, some of the, of the responses you got? Actually, m most of people uh, find it very difficult to answer this question. It is, yeah. You don't need to necessarily say, I know like this particular secret. It's not, it's not about this. It's about basically having an interesting discussion where you, while you're discussing with a person, you can get a little bit of insight into the way that they think. I find, like, essentially a startup is a group of people that, especially tech startup, that their claim to existence is that they know something that nobody else does. Yes. Otherwise, I mean, why, how would we compete with Syngenta or anybody else? <laughs> they have like thousand times more people and resources. Yes. So we are claiming that we know something that nobody else does. Yes. Uh, so I think when I'm trying to collaborate with people, I try to figure out are they the kind of people that are able to uncover secrets, right? And figure out things that nobody else does. And are they, because it's, it's kind of a question of also of mentality, of believing that you can actually know something that nobody else does. It's a, it's a very big claim. And you need to have a very particular set of mind to live in an environment that, that would sustain a claim that we as a group of people know something that nobody else does. Starting a, a business doesn't mean that you will be able to find a life-work balance. It's, <laughs> uh, it's about being uh, obsessed about certain idea and being deeply enjoying doing something. At least for me, this is the only thing that allows me to move forward. Uh, if it would be anything else, if it would be about you know, having better lifestyle, having better balance between life and work, this is not the way to go, yeah. at least not the kind of startup that we are trying to create. Uh, so uh, it, I think if I can give any advice is that find something that is you are deeply enjoy doing to the level of obsession, and then a startup is a way to continue doing this. Yeah. Because if you go somewhere else and you go to your corporation, you will be told what to do. And so this will prevent you from focusing on what you enjoy doing. Yeah. A startup is a way to be to do what you like to do. But then forget about life. <laughs> <laughs> Yosef, thank you so much for being on the show today. I definitely learned a lot and I hope everybody out there was also able to, to learn something, which is part of our key goals here with these videos. Uh, make sure to stay a few more seconds so you see who is up next week. And I hope to see you there. Have a great Monday and have a great week. Hello, I'm the founder of Snack and Fruity Box Express, Oliver Stahl. I will talk next week on the next show about uh, the fact that we sold two enterprises, two startups to Selector, how I become the founder of these two enterprises and then an investor. Stay tuned, look for the next episode with me and uh, Cedric and uh, subscribe to Global Tech Box.